My name is Sam Vaknin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. The sovereign debt crisis of 2010-12 emanated from the realization that lower growth rates throughout the industrialized West were insufficient to guarantee the repayment of debts accumulated by their governments. The proceeds of the credits and loans assumed by public sectors throughout Europe and in the United States were plowed into successive futile attempts to stimulate ailing economies and avert banking crises and panics. But this second leg of the global Great Recession is less about stalling growth than about the perception and measurement of growth. As labor-intensive industries increasingly adopt information and automation-driven manufacturing, as these industries outsource and offshore, the anemic recovery that attended the 2008-9 conflagration in the industrialized West was rendered jobless. Corporations sit on hoarded cash piles driven by enhanced profitability and productivity even as workers languish in unemployment lines. Globalized labor and skills markets coupled with technological substitution for human employment, dented consumption. This, in turn, adversely affected investments. So, the twin classical engines of every recovery since the Second World War have been somewhat decommissioned. Bouts of fiscal and monetary profligacy failed to resuscitate moribund financial transmission mechanisms. But this is also a crisis of national accounting. The traditional ways of measuring growth simply fail to capture technological progress. The massive increase in purchasing power as it applies to consumer goods and products is also neglected. And a discernible improvement in externalities such as the environment is completely disregarded. Critical factors such as vastly improved health an increased life expectancy and therefore an extended economic horizon, public goods, or even changes in the quality of life, remain unreflected in the way that countries measure their output and adjust it. Indeed, current methodologies of quantifying gross and national domestic products, GDP and NDP, take a dim view of the precipitous and predictable drop in the prices of consumer goods, for example. The same computing power costs now one-fifth what it used to cost only three years ago. But this means that its contribution to the country's GDP is down by 81% in the same period of time, assuming 6% inflation in these three years. In other words, technological and productivity improvements translate into economic contraction in the way that we currently gorge our economies. So what am I trying to say? There's no recession, it's all a, an accounting mirage. Well, the fate of modern economies is determined by four types of demand. The demand for consumer goods, the demand for investment goods, the demand for money, and the demand for assets, which represent the expected utility of money, or we can call it deferred money. Periods of economic boom are characterized by a heightened demand for goods, both consumer and investment, a rising demand for assets, and low demand for actual money, low savings, low capitalization, high leverage. Investment booms foster excess, for instance, excess capacity, that invariably lead, these excesses lead to investment busts. But economy-wide recessions are not triggered exclusively and merely by investment busts. They are the outcomes of a shifting sentiment, a rising demand of, uh, for money, at the expense of the demand for goods and assets. In other words, a recession is brought about when people start to rid themselves of assets, and in the process, deleverage, when they consume and lend less and save more, and when they invest less and hire fewer workers. A newfound predilection for cash and cash equivalents is a surefire sign of impending and imminent economic collapse. This etiology indicates the cure. Reflation. Printing money and increasing the money supply are bound to have, to have inflationary 
effects. Inflation ought to reduce the public's appetite for a depreciating currency and push individuals, firms and banks to invest in goods and assets and reboot the economy. Government funds can, only, can also be used directly to consume and invest, although the impact of such interventions is far from certain. Economies revolve around and are determined by anchors, stores of value that assume pivotal roles and lend character to transaction and economic players alike. Well into the 19th century, tangible assets such as real estate and commodities constituted the bulk of the exchanges that occurred in marketplaces, both national and global. People bought and sold land, minerals, buildings, edibles, and capital goods. These were regarded not merely as means of production, but also as forms of wealth. Inevitably, human society organized itself to facilitate these exchanges. The legal and political system sought to support, encourage, and catalyze transactions by enhancing and enforcing property rights, by providing public goods, and by rectifying market failures. Later on, and well into the 1980s, symbolic representations of ownership of real goods and property, for instance shares, commercial paper, collateralized bonds, forward contracts, were all the rage. By the end of this period, these surpassed the size of markets in underlying assets. Thus, the daily turnover in stocks, bonds and currencies dwarfed the annual value added in all industries combined. Fantasy surpassed reality. Again, mankind adopted to this new environment. Technology catered to the needs of traders and speculators, businessmen and middlemen. Advances in telecommunication and transportation followed inexorably. The concept of intellectual property rights was introduced. Financial infrastructure emerged, replete with highly specialized institutions such as central banks and highly specialized businesses such as investment banks, jobbers and private equity funds. And we are in the throes of a third wave. Instead of buying and selling assets one way as tangibles or another as symbols, we increasingly trade in expectations. In other words, we transfer risks. The markets in derivatives, options, futures, indices, swaps, collateralized instruments and so on, are flourishing. Society is never far behind such shifts. Even the most conservative economic structures and institutions now strive to manage expectations. Thus, for example, rather than tackle inflation directly, central banks currently seek to subdue it by issuing inflation targets. In other words, they aim to influence public expectations regarding future inflation. No one deals with tangibles. No one deals with symbols anymore. Everyone is trading expectations and risks. The more abstract the item traded, the less cumbersome it is, and the more frictionless the exchanges in which it is swapped. The smooth transmission of information gives rise to both positive and negative outcomes, more efficient markets on the one hand, and contagion, contagion on the other hand, less volatility on the one hand, and swifter reactions to bad news on the other hand, hence the need for market breakers. The immediate incorporation of new data in prices on the one hand is complemented with asset bubbles on the other hand, the good and the bad. Hitherto, even the most arcane and abstract contract traded was somehow attached to and derived from an underlying tangible asset, no matter how remotely. But this linkage may, may soon be dispensed with. The future may witness the bartering of agreements that have nothing to do with real-world objects or values. In days to come, traders and speculators will be able to generate on the fly their own custom-made one-time investment vehicles for each and every specific transaction. They will do so by combining off-the-shelf publicly traded components. Gains and losses will be determined by arbitrary rules or by reference to extraneous events. Real estate, commodities and capital goods will revert to their original forms and functions, bare necessities to be utilized and consumed, not speculated on.